Can you answer mine? It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, pardons for postal workers. The Prime Minister announces the government will introduce a new law to swiftly exonerate the victims of the post office scandal. Alex Salmond is in the house, batting away Barbie allegations that he stole a piece of the stone of destiny. And King Charles is being urged to end centuries of tradition and stop using real fur in the guards' bearskin hats. Why? Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the brand new 2024 version of the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. And boy, have we got a show for you tonight. I'll be telling you exactly why working from home is a disaster for Great Britain, and I've got the stats to prove it. I'll be calling out Sir Keir Starmer for pretending he's got a clue about what to do to control immigration. And I'll be asking you, how could I look wearing a hat? We'll be bringing it all to you over the next two hours. Plus, you'll get the latest on the post office scandal and who should be shelling out to compensate the victims. And I'll tell you the answer to this question. What's love got to do with it? Hang on to your hats, people. This is going to be a ride you will not forget. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We're coming out with all guns blazing. <laughs> now, Rishi Sunak is promising justice for victims caught up in the Horizon scandal, but just who is going to be paying for it? Get in touch with me. The Republic's phone lines and mailroom are open for business. Call us on 0344 499 1000. Text the word TALK plus your message to 8722. Or you can tweet me, of course, at TALK TV using the hashtag IROMG. So welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. And if you haven't seen it this week, we've already got this amazing new studio uh, to replenish ourselves with and to celebrate uh, exactly what is going on in the new year. And what seems to be going on in the new year uh, is that we are having the biggest scandal of all time, the biggest incredible story of all time. Nobody can quite understand why it's taken this long for everything to happen, right? It seems to be business as usual, however, in the House of Commons, as once again, Rishi Sunak faced a battering from Keir Starmer over his promises on cutting migration and the post office scandal, which is rumbling on. Sunak's making the not so reassuring guarantee that some, that some of the people affected by the scandal will receive a mere £75,000 in compensation. Joining me to discuss the fallout from the First Prime Minister's questions of 2024 is Talk TV's very own Chief political correspondent, Mr Peter Cardwell. Peter, a very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham for the first time, I think, this year. I think I'm right in saying. Hi, Mike. Great um, to be here. Yeah. It was a, a reasonable tussle today. Um, tell us about the best bits. Yes, indeed. It was certainly a, a response to a lot of the pressure that has built up over the past few days. Rishi Sunak very quickly getting out of the blocks, a planted question from Lee Anderson asking him about the post office scandal. This is what Rishi Sunak had to say. Today, I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation yeah. to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal, are swiftly exonerated and compensated. Yeah! We will also introduce a new upfront payment of £75,000 for the vital GLO group of postmasters. <laughs> and can I thank my honourable friend, the member for Thurska Moulton, for all his hard work yeah! on this issue. He will set out more details to the House shortly. We will make sure that the truth comes to light, we right the wrongs of the past, and the victims get the justice they deserve. Yeah! Well, they get so the justice whether, they you them or, whether you love him or loathe him, Mike, there's decisive action there from Rishi Sunak, and there has been that at least £75,000. Hopefully, that will happen, the government hopes, by the end of this year, and those people will be exonerated. And, of course, there'll be a lot more to come in terms of compensation and properly, fully clearing their names as time goes on.
Yeah, I mean, he has certainly taken decisive action and it's very welcome, I'm sure, for an awful lot of people. But £75,000 to some is not very much money and many of them are being offered possibly the chance to get 600000 if they sign on the yeah. dotted line. Others may get even more because there could be all sorts of class action lawsuits coming. Um, if you're a lawyer, you're going to be looking to cash in on this as well, I would imagine. So the ambulance chasers will be all over this like a rash. But what about who actually picks up the tab? Because at the end of the day... We shouldn't be doing that. It shouldn't be costing you, me, and the rest of my panel sitting here um, a load of money um, to make up for some mistakes made by a big, massive international global company like Fujitsu. Exactly, Mike, and this is where this all goes next. There are far more questions than answers, and I think in terms of the uh, compensation, in terms of culpability, the post office, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the UK, you and I, the taxpayer, basically own the uh, post office, is part of it. But of course, Fujitsu, that huge international global uh, computer business, which has its tentacles in many parts of how the government runs IT, there are lots and lots of contracts there, Big question for Rishi Sunak. And indeed, Keir Starmer. Would Keir Starmer, for example, say that he won't give Fujitsu any more contracts if he became Prime Minister? Because there are billions of pounds of contracts that Fujitsu has, but how much money will it come? Also, individuals as well. There's a lot there in terms of individual engineers, people who are behind the system. Some of them, one in particular, who denies any wrongdoing, wanting, uh, wanting um, immunity from prosecution, should he give evidence to the public inquiry. So this really is, it may seem 25 years, since this started and factually it is but it really is just the beginning mm. in terms of getting justice for those post office sub postmasters and their families who've had their lives absolutely wrecked by this and what about sir ed davy he was due to ask a question today at pmqs but uh, he was mysteriously absent well, that's for um, personal reasons, for family reasons, and um, that he wasn't there. So he did have a legitimate excuse not to be in Parliament, but certainly his role is under the spotlight. Lots of people asking questions about when he was Postal Affairs Minister between 2010 and 2012. There have been, of course, lots of other postal ministers, but originally uh, there, uh, when Alan Bates, who's the man at the centre of all this, the campaigner, Mr Bates versus the Post Office was the name of the ITV drama. Well, he asked uh, Ed Davey initially for a meeting and was told it was so serve no purpose. The men did eventually meet, but certainly Ed Davies' role when he was a minister has uh, been highlighted hugely. So uh, he's someone who very quickly and very frequently asks for other people to resign. Now people are saying maybe he should look in the mirror as one victim put it. Mm. Absolutely right. Peter, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. That's Peter Cardwell, uh, Talk TV's political uh, editor there. In the studio with me tonight to give their reactions, political commentator Lucy Beresford, barrister and futurist Andrew Eborn, and assistant editor of Spikes, Ella Whelan. Welcome to all of you. Thank Lucy, um, I imagine that uh, you, like the rest of us, couldn't quite imagine this story being the first big story of the year that was going to grip the nation. It kind of came out of the blue, but it shouldn't have, really. Well, it, it didn't entirely come out of the blue because it's been written up about a lot in mm. periodicals like The Private Eye and Computer Weekly. They've been writing about yeah. it for Well, I mean, the decade. newspapers have as well, but the thing uh, is, yes. it's never quite had this kind of It volume, hasn't had has the it? momentum. No. And I, despite the fact that it was an incredible drama, I also can't help feeling that it's partly because there is no other news mm. and there was almost no other TV uh, programme that was kind of bringing people together in quite the same way as this one did. And it becomes a talking point so more people watch it. And I think... I think it's that momentum that has really seen Rishi Sunak make the announcement today. And the, and the tragedy is that it does seem like it's been a TV programme that's kick-started everything. Right. That's the tragedy of it. Actually, nothing was really happening. And there were small pockets of compensation here for very small numbers of people, particularly the people who had the, the gumption to actually stand up to the, the big yeah. might of, of, po of the post office and challenge them. But if you, if you think that actually it is a David versus Goliath scenario, it shouldn't actually have come to that. No, it should never have come to that. Andrew, you're a, a lawyer. Absolutely. I mean, the lawyers will literally be salivating at the prospect of what could be years and years and years of litigation. Well, because there's no reason why any of these people who have been so badly treated yeah. should sign on the dotted line and say, oh, thanks very much indeed. I'll take the 75 grand. Yeah, it, it is the greatest miscarriage of justice yeah. that we've seen in the UK for a very, very long yeah. time. Or well, maybe it's ever. quite right. And it's quite right that we sort of shine a spotlight on it. There are many more questions about what happened. I mean, the basic 
basically, the ITV drama, the trouble is they mix a bit of reality with a bit of fictionalization. Yeah. And that's what we Very much like this show, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. But what they've got, they've got a lot of different people coming forward now, these uh, sub post office masters, mm. and talking about their stories. And they've been on all over the media at the moment. And the tragedy, when they are, they used to be the cornerstone of any local community. Mm. And they've been basically vilified within that community. The damage that they've suffered is horrendous. Yeah. And at the moment, they're trying to work out a compensation. It would normally take years and years and years to overturn well, a it. Has, well, it has done, hasn't it? But they're talking about trying to uh, basically speed that up. Mm. And what they're saying today is maybe what we're going to do is get a few guilty people will be let off. Mm. But isn't that much better than one innocent person? Well, as a baby lawyer, we were always told that it's better that 99 guilty people are let off than one innocent person mm. convicted. Yes. That's got to be right. Yes, I suppose so. But, Ella, one of the things that we're hearing at the moment, some of the people in the legal fraternity are saying this is very dangerous as a precedent because it means that Parliament is outlawing, um, you know, giving everything to the power of the lawyers and actually Parliament is sticking its nose into things which it shouldn't do because after this, everyone will say, well, you can just make a new law, can't you? Yeah, and I think that is a problem, but I think more importantly is if I was somebody who was affected by this or the kid of someone who's affected by this, I'd say take them to court and get everything you yeah. can. Yeah, take them to you the cleaners, wouldn't you? Yeah, because there's, you know, it's. I think there's two levels to this. There's the sort of technical legal question of people being exonerated and proper justice being seen to be done and cash being given to people. But there's also just a much big political question of this. It's sort of a clear example of... Uh, the little person being screwed. Mm. And it's symptomatic of what a lot of people are feeling this country is like at the moment, yeah. which is nobody cares, no-one will listen to you. And, you know, individuals like Ed Davey or Paula Vennels, uh, you know, might be two people who are involved in a, you know, a lot of post office bosses, a lot of, you know, people high up in government who turned a blind eye to all of this. But the reason why individuals like that become so important is because they do the kind of go away, right. you're so annoying, small yes. person thing. And I think there's, you know, in all areas of politics, there are instances of that, whether it's discussions about immigration, mm. Brexit, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's, there is this sense that people have that ordinary people just aren't listened to and are ignored. And this is an example yeah. of that happening on an extreme I think scale. so. And worse than that, in a way, because not only were they ignored, but yeah. they were kind of vilified. They were actually they were, made they to were feel... prosecuted yeah. by the post office. Yeah. Who not, and it's not even just that they were prosecuted. They were prosecuted with the post office in full knowledge that there were hundreds, if not thousands, mm. of people that this was happening to. And the post office said to their own helpline staff, you must say to these post submasters, Oh, you're the only one that's yeah. having a problem yeah. with this Horizon uh, product. Uh, it's called lying, isn't it? It's basically yeah. lying. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and they, I mean, it's, that, what it is. it's that corporate malfeasance on a grand mm. scale. Yeah. And no one at the moment is seeing anything happening to the people with it. Exactly. Okay, so a woman loses her CBE. What does that actually achieve? Mm. Whereas actually, you've got a, a, a systemic problem here twofold really one which is corporate governance, and one which is who is still making sure that. Um, uh, Horizon and Fujitsu's products are still being um, contracted mm. within the government. And, and there are further once again, well, It comes yes. back once again to who's going to pay all this yeah. compensation because at some point or other, I think we'll have to put a limit on what the government puts in, which is basically our money, and how much Horizon are going to set aside or how much Fujitsu are going to set aside for this kind of fee. But let's have a look at the, a little bit of breaking news here. A petition demanding that Sir Ed Davey return his knighthood has now reached... 10,000 signatures within one day of the petition actually being launched. Now, we saw, uh, of course, the CBE being returned um, from um, Paula Vendels yeah. because she saw that one million people had actually said that she should do it, and the Prime Minister had suggested it as well. I mean, you know, it's a start, I suppose, but, I mean, again, lots of people say she made an awful lot of money while she was doing that job. She misled an awful lot of people, um, and it's not really good enough to just go, oh, here's my gong, sure. uh, can I go away now? Well, no, you can't, actually. Well, yeah. one, one, in a particularly emotional interview with one of the Postmasters um, in the press over the last few days, one of them said, well... I don't just want her CBE, I want her pension. And, yeah. her, you know, I, I, was, I was stripped of everything mm. for decades. Why is it that she just gets to give back her well, nice because back. much of her remuneration was based on profits made by yeah. the post office yeah. and really good... And behavior. bonuses as well, right? And, and that's the real question, is it? What happened to the money? A lot of the sub-post yeah. office had to pay that said, money back. Anyway, the money's so gone somewhere. Go? Mm. They had to pay that money. Mm. Where is that money now? So we look forensically, mm. and sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm. What, uh, what Alan Bates has said, because everybody said, let's get him a knighthood and so on and so forth. He's not going to do that until everybody else's gong has disappeared. Yes. And he works on that sort of premise. But we need to look... There 
were so many questions which are not yet answered. Well, it was, I... it was systematic that actually there, w there was a court case whereby the judge, actually, Peter Fraser, actually said to the post office, um, your system actually, we're, we're going to get an IT expert to come mm. and look at your system. Yeah. And he's found lots of discrepancies. Right. Yeah. And basically the post office rubbished that and actually closed down the yeah. case. That, so there were actually... Over the last 10 years, there have been ways in which the post office has systematically tried to pull the wool sure. over everyone's eyes. And also, the guy who's currently seeking, um, you know, immunity from yes. prosecution, um, I think Gareth Jenkins is yes, his name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was one of those people who actually gave evidence against the postmasters well, and the postmistresses, saying that they were basically stealing money because there was nothing wrong uh, with the system. Uh, absolutely. So for him to say that he now wants to give evidence and be exonerated in some way, while he was responsible to a large extent as being the witness for the prosecution who locked these people up yes. or who made sure that they got convicted, you know, I'm not sure we should give it to him. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Matt. And what, as, it, as we said, there's so many questions mm. that need to be answered. What I also hate, when looking from the justice point of view, is that people were forced to admit guilt when they weren't guilty. And that should never, ever, ever happen. So when people have basically said, look, well, if you, if you do this, you won't go to prison, plead guilty to this uh, basically fraudulent yeah. accounting, and, and we'll let you off the record, yeah. you won't go to prison. Incredible. That's got to be wrong. Never, ever, ever plead guilty if you're not guilty. No, exactly right. But it's easy to say when you're sitting in a nice, well, cosy television studio, uh, when your best, life is I, I being... I love this TV show. It isn't it great? But when your life is being literally no, flashed absolutely. before your eyes, and, and they're saying to you, you if, could lose everything yeah. if you don't do and this. If, if you've been right? told you are the only one, yeah. I think if they had known yes. that there were, you know, 900 of yeah. them, it would have been a completely different Well, I've audience. heard people say that if it hadn't been for the time that it happened, if it yes. happened now, yeah. social media would have taken over. There would have been Facebook groups, mm. there would have been Twitter spheres, there would have been, mm. you know, Instagram accounts sure. where people would have known that others were suffering in the same way. I, I, but back I, then, they didn't know. No, absolutely. And, and you're right, because if this hadn't been the ITV programme... Mm it wouldn't have got the headline news that it does now. Yeah. That, reason... that just speaks to storytelling, though, I think. Oh, I, think I think it was the way in which it was dramatised that suddenly took all of this material that had been repeatedly, as you say, in the press, yes. in Computer Weekly, probably quite... Mm. I'm sure it's a great magazine. I've never read it, yeah. but it might be but a you bit know, dry. Hundreds of pieces were written in, in regular newspapers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds. And also, this is where it's quite difficult for Sarah Davy, I think, is because there were other people who were saying within Parliament, this is an issue. We've yeah. had um, Arbuthnot yes, and McKellen absolutely. who've been saying... And, and so what, how did those rumours not reach mm. Sir Ed Davey for him to say, oh, actually, I'm in position right. of, of doing something about it? And, and, and this all, is all what... Yes, uh, well, this is why I think that there's... One of the big problems is that there seems to be a trend towards blaming everything yeah. on the software yes. or on the tools, yes. on the technology. And that's a very easy out for someone like Ed Davey who comes out and says, well, I was lied to. Right. I mean, this I am disgusted by how much I was lied to. And you think, oh, come on. Yeah, really. You know, you're not allowed... You're not going to be able to get away... You get off the hook with, with that. But, but, but the, And if you... You know, the tools are only as good or bad as the people who are using them. Sure. And I think part of the problem with even blaming everything on Fujitsu, which some are very keen to do... Yes. ..is, is you know, failing to ascertain the fact that there were people mm. in Parliament yeah. who knew what was going on, who made a political decision that it was better to allow a few small-time people in small towns sure. catch the rap rather than open up a big scandal well, around what, the post what, office. What we also need yes, to do... Yes, we're going to have to come back to this because we're to... running out of time, but we didn't even get to Rwanda. You know, you say yes. there's no other stories in town. We'll get to it later on. You guys will be back. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is the brave, booming and bombastic independent Republican Mike Graham. Coming up, how e-scooters and e-bikes are now the main cause of traffic accidents and how London has become the most sluggish, slow-moving city in Europe. All caused by, you guessed it, Bank of the Week, Sadiq Khan. Do not go anywhere. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, in Khan's kingdom of you, less than 20 mile an hour zone, London has been blessed with a new honour. Yes, it's the slowest city in the world. A research team studied 387 cities all across the globe. And joining me now to make sense of this is former Top Gear presenter Steve Berry. Steve, good to see you. Uh, luckily for you, you haven't had to make your way in here and cross London uh, at a speed of a snail, um, which is basically what the average speed of London now is. You know, people say the 20 mile an hour zone has caused it. I don't think it's just the 20 mile an hour zone. It's the fact that there's so little room now because cars have been squashed and concertinaed in um, to smaller and smaller spaces to make way for bus lanes and cycle lanes and all the rest of it, that you just can't even, at any point, get above about nine miles an hour. Mike, I didn't have to cross London. I lived in London for a good few years. Um, I worked in the same building as you for a while. Uh, but I now live in Manchester, where we have a motorway, a road that's officially designated as a motorway, mm with a permanent 30-mile-an-hour limit, the Mancunian way. No, a no. motorway with a 30-mile-an-hour limit. You couldn't make it up. But if people think the road space is being used inefficiently, there are too many cars parked on the roads, get them off the roads and get them onto car parks, and what's with all, these, all this stuff in the road and these lines and these boxes? Why not make better use of the road space? It's almost if they're trying to stop others off from driving. Well, guess what? They are. That's exactly what they're doing. They really are, because they don't like motorists, even though motorists are the biggest cash cow now, I think, in the entire country. You know, you pay through the nose uh, for your petrol, you pay an incredible amount of fuel tax on that, you pay a road tax every single time you have to renew uh, that every year, you pay for driving in some parts of the country in the city. I mean, they haven't quite got a congestion charge in Manchester, but I think Andy Burnham's trying to get one. There is one in Birmingham, there is one in Glasgow, there is one in London, they're in Bath, Bristol, other places. You know, the motorist is basically a cash cow for local government. Sadiq Khan's making something like two to three hundred million pounds a year off the ULES charge. They would be very, very poor without us. Mike, the government's... I've been doing uh, some research recently for a book I'm writing about 100 years of motorcycling. And I've had to go back and read a lot of newspapers and magazines from yeah. the early days of motoring. Governments always had a complicated relationship with the owner of a motor vehicle. 
Because as you just very well pointed out, it's an excellent way of taxing people. Mm. They tax the fuel. They tax it when you buy the car. They tax it when you service the car. They charge you road tax. And the taxes that they collect from motorists are a huge part of what the Treasury collects each year. Yeah. And for them, it's incredibly handy. I mean, people think the government and all governments are in love with electric cars. They're not. They're not, because the current system of petrol and diesel is one of the best ways of collecting tax that's ever been devised. You can't avoid it. It's not like you can go and get some hooky petrol off a bloke in the pub that's just fallen off the back of a wagon. <laughs> it's been, for many decades, a great way for governments to collect tax. But when I've asked them about the states of the roads, and the states of the roads here in Manchester are just beyond a job. Yeah. Remember when you used to go on foreign holidays? You'd go to Greece or you'd go to Tunisia or somewhere like that, and you could come back and people would say, oh, what was it like? And you say, oh, it's great, sunshine, hot. Oh, the roads are terrible, though. <laughs> we, we hire the car, we, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> We're like that now. People come to Britain, I tell you this yeah. is true, people come to Britain and go home saying, Britain's great, but the roads are a nightmare. No, listen, you're we, absolutely right. Like, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I used to go... Know. My parents used to take us to Italy as kids, and we used to drive all the way to Italy and go camping in a place called Lido di Esolo, right? And, you know, you'd come back from, from places like Italy going, God, blimey, I'm glad that we don't live there because it's lovely, um, but it's completely chaotic. You know, nothing works. You've got a queue for everything. Nobody knows what they're doing. You know, Britain has now become the Italy uh, of the sort of last century because nothing works here. I'll tell you a little, uh, a little story. I got a, a bus lane ticket this week, right? for something that I did over the Christmas period. I was driving behind a bus on a road, which only just recently, and I know the road, it's just recently been redeveloped, right? And so what they do is they've apparently, I couldn't tell because I was just driving behind a bus. The road splits at some point, and there's a barrier between where I should have gone and where the bus lane is. So I assumed that was the opposite side of the road. So I just stayed behind the bus. And now I've got to pay 65 quid for the privilege of well, not I, knowing. I got. I got one for entering one of those yellow boxes with the hatch lines. Oh, yeah. Which you are yeah, supposed that. to enter right. unless your exit is clear. Yes. Now, as I was following two buses side by side, double decker buses, yeah. quite how I'm able to see past them from the driving seat of my Jag, I have absolutely no bloody idea. So, what do they want me to do? Stop at green lights, wait until the bus has got 150, both buses have got 150 yards down the road, and then I can see. No, I found out how much that particular box earns, and it's the, it's on it's an archway in North London as you're leaving the city, yes. and it's the highest earning one of those boxes in the country. And again, it's been a great way. The motorist, saying it again, the motorist is an awesome source of revenue for the Treasury. And when they go on about they don't want us to use our car as much, they want to, they want more bus use and more integrated travel and all that sort of stuff. When you actually talk to them, they will admit that they do wonder where they're gonna get the billions, not millions, yeah. the billions of pounds that they collect from motorists. Exactly right. I mean, it's an absolute nightmare, and the speed that we can now travel at is ludicrous and ridiculous. Steve Berry, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Steve Berry there to reporting in uh, from Manchester. But let me tell you about this. The army is once again under pressure to change their ways. This time, it comes from Stephen Fry, who has called for an end to the use of real bear fur in the iconic bearskin ceremonial caps, arguing that tradition is never an excuse for cruelty. But the Ministry of Defence say the fur comes from legal and licensed hunts intended to manage populations and that bears are not killed to order. Now, I'm joined in the studio by royal expert and biographer Ingrid Seward. Um, but I don't think she is actually in the studio. Ingrid, you're not in the studio, are you? Um, now, yeah, as you can see, um, I've got a little bear skin here um, and it's very soft, I have to say. I'm going to put it on uh, and see just how it fits. There we are. Now, this thing goes around the, the thing like, goes around like that. There you go. Now, I think I look rather good, actually. I've never worn one of these before. I was assured it would be one size fits all. Um, what do you think of it? I think you look better without it. 
<laughs> well, listen, I'm going to keep it on for the purposes of uh, uh, what can only be described as feeling the uh, the vibe of it. But people are saying this is a tradition that needs to be maintained, you know, for the for the for the history of the regiment that wears it. They've always worn it. Why on earth should we be bullied into not wearing it by people like Stephen Fry? But I must admit, I actually don't see why, if you can make something which is um, uh, slightly less harmful to bears and animals, why not? Well, I think what they should do is uh, they should use all the bear skins they've got because what are you going to do with them? Um, I certainly don't think any new ones should be made and, and maybe they're not being made. Maybe mm. they are using all the ones they've got. But it would be a great shame when you think of all the bears that have probably been slaughtered yeah. to make these bear skins ended up of no use at all. So I think that they should use what they've got and then certainly, certainly they should never, ever have any new ones. But what we don't know is if maybe they don't anyway. Maybe they're all just old and used ones. Right. Well, I was listening to a campaigner from PETA a bit earlier on today who said that it takes one bear to provide one bear skin hat, which seems a very bad use of, of the bear. Um, and, and I think that there's still a, a hunting business that is subsidised to some extent um, by the orders that come in from the household cavalry to actually get more bear skin. So, I mean, if we can stop them killing the bears, I guess that would be good. Of course it would, and I think m most people would agree with that. But but what I was trying to say is don't let's waste what they've already got. So if suddenly all this uniform was banned, these bear skins that have so many bears have forfeited their lives for are just going to be left to rot. So we don't want that to happen. Sure. But I do feel that, that absolutely, that certainly it's not a very... It's not a nice idea in this era. I don't think it was ever a nice idea, but don't let's waste what is already there. No, I think that's a good point, because at the end of the day, in the, you know, in the fullness of time, if the bear, you know, without wishing to be too unkind, if the bear's already been killed um, and you've already got the hat, you're not really gaining anything by getting rid of it, are you? Absolutely nothing, except just to appease a few a few people that are complaining. And I think it would be far better to put their complaints somewhere else. And I think most people will agree that this is just not what we want in, in, you know, in our times. I don't think we want to see animal skins used in any way at all, if we can help it. No, I think that's absolutely right. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I imagine that King Charles, being the king of sort of, you know, environmentalism, as well as many other things, he would probably agree with Stephen Fry, wouldn't he? Well, he does seem to... Stephen Fry is a very good friend of his, but we've seen an awful lot of, picture of pictures of, of King Charles as the Prince of Wales uh, and, indeed, the king in a bearskin. But I think he probably would agree with Stephen Fry now, but I don't think he'd agree to destroying the, all the ones that they've already got. Yes. Well, I've taken your advice and decided to try and look better without it, so I've taken it off. I think um, you do, Mike. Definitely. Thank you very much indeed. You're very kind. Um, it's quite weird. I'm not really a hat wearer, to be honest. I always feel slightly as a, as a sort of claustrophobic. But let's talk a bit about the other big story this week, um, the developments in the uh, Epstein case. There's still many, many more revelations coming out from these court papers, as we knew they would. Um, we've got all sorts of allegations against Prince Andrew. Um, Piers Morgan last night interviewed... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein's brother, who said he was convinced that he didn't commit suicide and that something else slightly more mysterious happened to him. Um, what's the what's the mood, do you think, currently in, in Windsor? Um, not just at the uh, at Prince Andrew's place, but, but what's King Charles thinking about it all? I, I wish we knew what King Charles was really thinking, but, uh, the, I mean, the newspapers have really weighed in on this story in a big way, and it is, it, it is the voice of public opinion. And things don't get any better for the Duke of York. And I think that the, the general feeling, certainly uh, amongst, you know, the, 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 the newspapers, is that he really has to voluntarily give up his grand lifestyle and do something. Um, I, we don't know what. Mm. We don't know what he might be able to do, but I think he needs to do something. I don't think it looks good for the monarchy that he should be sitting in his palatial, very palatial residence, um, Royal Lodge, and he, he's paid the rent there. He's done refurbishment there. He's perfectly entitled to do there. But if he was a uh, really feeling person, he would say to his brother, his brother, the king, look, I can't stay here. 
you know, this looks all wrong. I'm going to go somewhere else and lead a very quiet life. Yeah. But I don't think he can be thrown out. I think that would look wrong as well. I think it's got to come from him. And I think it's time that he did something like that. But it can't be forced by his brother. I think that would be really wrong. But his brother, now he was he was protected by the late queen, mm. by the fact that, you know, he was her favoured son, if you like, or the son she worried about most. But now he's part of the generation. Or, you know, he's, he, he's king. The king, his king, is his brother. Yeah. So he's really got to be seen to be doing something himself rather than being pushed. Absolutely. I think you're probably right. Ingrid, thank you very much indeed. Ingrid Seward there, uh, royal biographer, of course, giving us the benefit of her um, opinion on what should happen to Prince Andrew because he really cannot carry on in the way that he currently is. You're watching, of course, the free and the brave Independent Republic of Mike Graham, Atlas now, joining me in the studio after the break, my old friend from the home country, the old country Scotland. It's Alex Salmon discussing all manner of things north of the border and how he's apparently nicked something You'll see it all coming up next. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are What's you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Let's turn our eyes to Scotland now. The whereabouts of a slice of the sacred stone of destiny has been in question. A piece of the ancient symbol of Scotland's monarchy had been presented to the former First Minister Alex Salmond as a personal gift in 2008. Uh, Alex continuously denied knowing the location of the stone, with it later appearing in a cupboard at the SNP HQ. 
Whoops, there was a lot of stuff in there. Uh, obviously, it's been well looked after. But joining me in the studio, the man in question himself, the former First Minister of Scotland, Mr Alex Salmon. Welcome, Alex. Um, I'm very glad to be here. My, my, I didn't recognise you without your bare skin on. Well, listen, I quite like the look of it, to be honest. I, I, I think might... you should keep it for future editions. I bet it's nice. I mean, it's nice and warm as well. Well, so they say, they keep fainting. It's better, than, yeah, well, it's better than uh, not having an umbrella. Now, we've got lots to talk to you about um, and not a great deal of time to do it. So let's kick off, first yeah. of all, with this stone of uh, destiny business. What's all this about? Why are you being accused of stealing? from uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the I, crown. I, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. That's Alistair Jack, who people wouldn't know, but it's the Secretary of State for Scotland, and Lord Forsyth, if mm. people have long memories, yes. used to be Secretary of State for Scotland a long time ago. I remember him. But a couple of clowns, basically. I mean, but the, the story of destiny is the sacred relic of Scotland. Yes. It came from the Holy Land to Ireland to Iona, where kings of Dalriada mm. were, were, were crowned on it, and then came to, I, uh, came to Schoon in, in Persia, where for 300 years it was part of the Because it's known as the Stone of Schoon, isn't it? Well, that's why. I, because I, was th th I always had trouble with the pronunciation. It's, well, it's, 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 uh, it's not pronounced Scone. It's right. definitely Schoon. Right. Uh, uh, just, just outside Perth. Uh, and the uh, kings of Scots were, uh, uh, were crowned there and the stone was part of the ceremony. It was by which they swore allegiance oh. to the land and the people. Yes. Now, Edward I, Edward Plantagenet, mm played magnificently by Patrick McGowan in Braveheart. A nasty, yes. nasty piece of work. 1296, <laughs> invaded Scotland, grabbed, stole the stone, yeah. brought it to Westminster Abbey, built a coronation chair, and he and his successors sat on it right. for 700 years to symbolise their overlordship mm. of Scotland. Yes. In 1950... So it means a lot to Scots who want independence, in other words. Well, it certainly means a lot more to Scots than it does to... You, know, you see, my for, father, for, for from England, Glasgow, just, never mentioned it to me when he was growing up in London. Well, you know, see, this is the whole point. Because in 1950, the, the cause of Scotland was reignited by four bold students from Glasgow University who, on Christmas Day, came down and repatriated yes. the stone. Right. And note the terminology here. Edward I stole it. The four students repatriated Yeah, but how did it get back into your, uh, you know, well, possession? Well... Because I know we're going to get into this one of the week. Unfortunately, in the process of repatriating it, yeah. it split into they two. They broke it. Uh, Bloody students. There right? is, no, I'll tell you something. There's an argument it was weakened by a suffragette's bomb in 1908. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, There's a lot it, of history. It, it proved quite convenient because right. they, they had two Austin 8 cars. Right. And they managed to get one bit of the stone in each car and got back eventually to mm. Scotland with both bits of the stone. Where do you hide a stone? In a garden? In a stonemason's yard. That's not bad. And a guy called Bailey Bertie Gray mended the stone. Yeah. When he mended the stone, he had a fragment. Yes. About a two-ounce fragment mm. of a 25-stone stone... Yeah. ..which he gave uh, to John McCormack. King John McCormack, who'd financed the whole escapade, and his son, Regis Professor of Law at Edinburgh University, Sir Neil McCormack, gave it to me in uh, 2008. I gave it to the SNP after first checking with the Cabinet Secretary, no less, that the right. historic Scotland didn't want it. Right. So perfectly, perfectly okay. reasonable. So you're claiming that you're in, you're in good order. We'll get into I'm more of this. I'm good order. We'll get into more of this on, on Plank of the Week. But let's talk about let's do, We'll things. do the whole... St I'll bring along the fragment. Bring along the fragment and we'll do the whole story. Watch this space. Watch this space, 7pm on Friday. Now, uh, what about this call that you've been uh, getting from Westminster? They want to see you uh, and Nicola Sturgeon down here to answer some questions. Well, that'll be a see you, Jimmy call. Yeah, yeah. I nearly said that. Uh, was, well, they're, they're calling every uh, Secretary of State, and what they're investigating, this is the Scottish... This, for some ridiculous reason, despite uh, the Scottish Parliament, the Westminster still has a Scottish Affairs Select yes. Committee. They have to find something to do. Mm. And what they've found to do is to explore the relationships between the London government yes. and the Scottish government since devolution. Yes. So they've, they, they've called... Uh, Can't they just read the papers? <laughs> that's a good I mean, point. Tell them, it? Listen, they have, as I say, they have to find something to yeah. do. And so anyway, I mean, I always respect parliamentary committees, so I, I'm going along, apparently Nicola's going along, all the surviving, extant, living yes. former First Ministers are going along. Uh, and I, I think is this because Hamza Yusuf went to see er Erdogan in Turkey? I think this maybe is. Prov I think the investigation was set up before then, mm. but it's actually what it's about because there's been a lot of spats. Let's yeah. call them that. Some of them really stupid, mm. silly spats. Uh, he didn't go to see Erdogan in Turkey. He met him at the uh, at the climate change yes. uh, summit in Qatar. 
Uh, and incidentally, perfectly legitimately, because climate change, believe it or not, is within the legislative responsibilities yeah, of the I mean, Scottish Parliament. If you think uh, that you should be sending public officials in vast numbers but that's at a, vast public sorry, expense, that's I, a different I, I disagree. That's a different argument, Mike. Yeah. I mean, they were there, right. right? They were there from London, they were there from Edinburgh, they were there from Turkey or Turkey. And, and Hamza met President Erdogan. Now, why shouldn't you meet President Erdogan? I mean, well, if, you're, isn't the if issue, you're at an though, international summit, yeah, then but hang on. other But isn't other the issue, though, that, that, that if you're going to talk to a foreign leader as a leader of a country of which you are a devolved nation, which you are not the leader of, as it were, or who you do not represent, surely you should have a conversation with David Cameron, who's the Foreign Secretary, which he clearly didn't have, before we had the meeting. And I think that's the issue. Well, and I mean, they don't trust look, there is a, there is They a don't pro trust it. Look, there is a protocol whereby... Look, I mean, the idea that I would have to be chaperoned uh, when I was First Minister yes. meeting other other uh, international leaders is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, you could imagine... Well, you don't need what, a chaperone, but he does. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's, a, another that's another matter. A, that's a different argument. Now, the argument from the Scottish Government is they told... Uh, they had a guy from the Foreign Office who was meant to be there, but was off on his break or something. He couldn't have turned up. Working from home. At short notice, working from home. Yeah. The, the London said, oh, that's not true, and they're having this stupid argument. Mm. But I think there's something interesting. I mean, generally speaking, on this issue, and I may not say this on many issues, I'm actually on the side of, uh, of the First Minister here. I, I think Cameron's letter was petty. But it was interesting to me that I think relationships in terms of these things between the Edinburgh government and the London government were at their best in the period from 2011 to 2014, where we had set the date and the timing and the format of the referendum and therefore, we didn't have to use every other issue as some sort of no, arm wrestling. but you were also very good, and I remember it, uh, you doing it. You were very good at saying that you were blaming Westminster for things that they couldn't give you and making out that actually the reason you couldn't do things was because of Westminster, which wasn't always quite well, the are case. You, are you saying I was good at politics, Mike? You are well, you're, you're accusing me you of being good at politics. Well, I, 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 okay, I surrender. <laughs> but look, there was a fair amount of give and take. I mean, you didn't advertise yeah. things at the time. And, you know, I mean, people could believe this or not, but, you know, I actually facilitated the UK government getting back into the leadership mm. compound in Beijing to talk to the Chinese government. Because at the time, it just so happened that I had a good relationship with the Premier of China. Yeah. And David Cameron and Nick Clegg were in the doghouse uh, because they'd gone off to meet the Dalai Lama without telling yes. the Chinese. And I, at the request of the British ambassador, facilitated him getting back into the leadership compound, which enabled... You know what was a, a rebending of the repairing yeah. of the but relationship between example. Britain and China. But that's a good example of but, working together yeah, rather is. than not working but together. But on the other hand, if, let's say I was going to see uh, uh, President Barroso, mm. where I didn't get much change out of, incidentally, mm. to talk about Scotland's accession to the European Union after independence, right? As I did. The idea I would take the British ambassador no, along with me to, to tell but tales But you probably shouldn't have been talking about that until you got it, by the oh, no, way. No, but that's oh, no, no, you know, no, no. But I'm going to get in trouble no, for well, you're wrong time. about that, because you, you have to prepare the ground, regardless of what side you're on. Yeah. You have to... I mean, if they'd known what they were doing with Brexit, this country would be but in a better position. But they did prepare the ground. It's just they, that the well, ground exactly. so fell away. Exactly, so I preparing the ground. OK, <laughs> all right, I'll let, you, I'll let you off with that. Now, the big election uh, year coming up. We've got to get your predictions for when. We think it's going to be in October. Uh, it can't be in November. So, who's going to win? And how about five? Sure it can't be in November. Why not November? Well, apparently there's a, a deal with the Americans that we don't have elections in the same month. Really Believe it or December, not. then. I mean, the last one was in December. December's too late. Never mind no, when it is. Who's no, no, going well, well, to get what? Well, let me deal with that point first. I think it's in the interest of the Conservative Party to have as few people voting as possible. Mm. And if it's in the interest of the Conservative Party, so regardless December. of whether they'll, they'll do whatever it takes <laughs> to keep people away from the polls, that's what all this identification yeah. rubbish was about. Right. So they, if they need to have it in December, it goes as late as possible because no Prime Minister, no sane person goes to the polls 15 20% behind them, the opinion polls. Yeah. He'll wait as long as he can. Yeah. Uh, I think the Tories will lose. I think they'll lose principally because of the economy. It is the economy stupid and they've run the economy But the economy stupid. might have recovered by then. Maybe, but people are not going to forget paying through the nose of interest rates over the last... People are not going to present their... their bill. You mean, that idiot, uh, uh, Howard Davis, Nat West, right, yes. saying it's easy to get mortgages. No, it isn't. It's not even just not easy to go on the mortgage ladder. The biggest... One of the biggest house builders in Scotland went bust this week. Mm. 
because <laughs> they can't sell the houses yeah. because people can't afford to right. get on the property ladder. And the damage that's been done to people's mortgages, to people's incomes, to people's assets and to people's businesses is not right. going to be forgotten. Well, let me pin you down. So Keir Starmer is the next Prime Minister, is that what you're telling me? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't. all that Keir Starmer has to do to become the next Prime Minister is keep his mouth shut and say as little as possible. Yeah. And he wins by how many? Uh, well, I don't think it's the uh, land... I mean, I think... I don't to, think it's the landslide. To, to win a landslide, I think you've got to win an election. I think you can win an election by default mm. because the government hands you it, but I don't think you get into landslide territory without giving the people some indication... Something to believe in. Yes, yeah, something to believe in. Yeah. It's an old-fashioned uh, call, that, isn't it? Alex Salmon, great to see you. Yeah, Thank you very much you. indeed. You'll be back on Plank of the Week on Friday. Wearing a different hat. 7pm, wearing a very different hat, uh, as will I. Uh, this is the marvellous and magical Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, up after the break, the work-shy Brits are still cowering in their homes, refusing to come into the office. That, plus your thoughts and your calls. 0344 499 1000. Calls will cost the national rate. Do not go anywhere. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about school today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for taking the mic. Now, anyone who's been listening and watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham for long enough will know my views on working from home. It was something the government thought would be a great idea almost four years ago, and it is still now casting a terrible shadow over the economy and the lifestyle of our society. Everywhere you go in this country, you can find pockets of deprivation, empty shop fronts and deserted streets. And the reason? 
You guessed it, it's the legacy of the working from home fraternity. You know the types. They can do their jobs without going out. They can tap away at a computer keyboard. They can send emails. They can huddle in their bedrooms and never meet another soul. The truth of the matter is, though, that the low growth in this country, the lack of investment, the turgid state of our hospitality industry and the creaking transport businesses are all the fault of the WFH theory, the middle-class specialists who dreamed up this idea are the kind of people that think you shouldn't really have a car, you can just rent one when you need it. You should cycle everywhere you need to go, you should only shop locally and you should absolutely never, ever commute anywhere. More and more businesses have worked out that working from home reduces productivity by between 10 and 20%. Getting people to work together in one place is a great thing. It provides focus, it creates ideas, and it genuinely helps people who are not socially inclined. Indeed, it actually forces people to go out. Without it, we are a much poorer place, literally. Well, now figures, new figures from the Department of Transport show that despite being urged to return to office spaces, there are still plenty of people not doing so. And many of them are in the public sector. Entire departments in the civil service rarely move from their living rooms on any given week. And the stats actually back this up. Rail passenger numbers are down 27% on pre-COVID numbers. And outside of London, the numbers of people boarding buses was down nearly 20%. All indicators of a less mobile workforce. The figures give the lie to those who say local economies are booming. As a result, people are simply not moving about as much. And if they are doing so, they're doing it in cars, where journeys are only down 8% on those same time frames. One thing is for sure. Shops are closing in towns across the country. Restaurants are giving up the ghost. And the biggest growth business is, wait for it, Greg's. Hardly the healthy option, is it? Of course, those working from home expect everything to be delivered to them by people who can't actually work from home. I've always said it's a recipe for disaster, and so it has proved. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch, and you can have your say on all the socials at Talk TV and on the phones, of course, 0344 499 1000. Let's hear from Roger in Hounslow. He wants to talk about driving in London. Roger. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, sir. What can you, what can you tell me? Well, driving in London, it's a bit of a joke these days, isn't it? It can it take is. you an hour to go up the Strand during kick-out time at the theatre. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried going um, up Upper Thames Street sometimes yep. during the hopeless. weekend when they've got roadworks? Absolutely hopeless. Have you ever tried going down Regent Street where there's no bus lane, so you get stuck behind a bus and you just have to stop when it stops? Not only are the bus lanes not there, they've got the bus stop in the middle of the road. I know. It's a nightmare. And you've got to pay more money for the privilege as well. Absolutely unbelievable. Listen, good to talk to you. We've got plenty more to do coming up uh, in the next hour because I'll be taking more of your calls then. We've caught some fly tippers red-handed and I want your thoughts. So phone in now about fly tipping. Tell us what you've seen. 0344 499 1000. Also, HS2 is now going to cost a staggering $66.6 billion just to get to Birmingham. We'll be back after this. Stay exactly where you are. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. 
Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk on TV, we're on radio, we're online, and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, building beleaguered HS2 from London to Birmingham will cost up to £66.6 .6 billion, almost twice the original estimate for the entire project. An historic beauty spot has been turned into a fly-tipping hellhole, while we've caught some foul fly tippers in the act, and the most pointless software update in history as Apple lets you save people's pronouns into your contact book. Ridiculous. Now, we're going to be asking you about fly tipping coming up later on. If you've fallen victim in your area has fallen victim to fly tipping, you'd get in touch with me. The Republic's phone lines and mailroom are open for business. Call on 0344 499 1000. Let's find out who's doing it. You can text the word TALK plus your message to 87222, or you can tweet me as well, at TalkTV, using the hashtag IROMG. Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. And I can tell you, it's another story about Andrew, because you might remember there's a couple of, uh, shall we say, mini-series being put together around the interview that Andrew did with Newsnight. And one of them's called A Very Royal Scandal, um, and in which you can see on the front page, not the front page of the Sun, but inside the Sun on page 7, uh, there's a picture, a reenactment, no less, of Prince Andrew's Central Park stroll with paedophile pal... Jeffrey Epstein. It's going to be recreated with Michael Sheen starring as Prince Andrew. Uh, he doesn't look a lot like him, but it's obviously a very poignant moment because this was the moment uh, that everybody said showed that Prince Andrew still consorted and still hung out with uh, Jeffrey Epstein even after he had been convicted of being a paedophile. So shortly after uh, Epstein was released from jail for child sex offences in 2011, this is the image that everybody saw around the world. A source says to The Sun, in the drama, Andrew thinks he is above everything and nothing can touch him, but it obviously ends up in a car crash. We'll bring you more uh, on the papers and what is more in store for Andrew. Double trouble, it says here, uh, coming up a little bit later on with our panel. But let's talk about love, because after all, it is what makes the world go round. It is, they say, a story as old as the world itself. The thing that has perplexed many a philosopher and thinker through the ages. It is, of course, the story of love and romance. Men are from Mars, remember, and women are from Venus. That was the opinion of the author John Bray in his best-selling book that identified just why it sometimes seems so difficult to communicate with the opposite sex. No doubt that's have become even harder now that we've got 72 opposite sexes, or is it genders? 
Some new research published today, though, from the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh seeks to bring a new twist to the conversation about why women and men are so different. According to a study of 3,900 adults, they reckon that women actually fall out of love quicker than men do. Really? And that, despite everything, it is largely due to the fact that men can't be bothered as they get older and that men aren't as busy around the home. Well, I'd have to say that that, I'm afraid, is a load of old cobblers. Some men might lose interest in their relationship long-term because it's boring. Some might just become a bit too comfortable in their pyjamas and slippers, and some might have actually found somebody else. Whatever the reason for the study's conclusion, I reckon they couldn't be more wrong. They looked at couples who had been together for as little as two years and compared them to people who'd been married for as long as 20. And guess what? Romance wasn't quite dead, but it was largely resting and probably needed a bit of help with resuscitation. We keep hearing about how separate bedrooms might be the answer, how separate bathrooms definitely help, and even separate houses, if you can afford it, are a recipe for success. But according to the study, women in long-term relationships spend more time cooking and doing chores, while men spend more time relaxing and napping. Really? Does anyone actually know couples like that? We used to call them the smug marrieds, the ones who were always making out that everything was perfect. Now they're all getting divorced in their 50s and looking for more adventures. Apparently, the key to keeping romance alive is to spend less time together. Well, I can tell you, that doesn't work either. I don't know if I'm the odd one out here, but I'm not sure I believe any of it. Even the women who hate me still actually love me, but there isn't any romance left, and that's just a fact of life. One of the professors who conducted the study says, there is an optimistic take. Even though romantic passion and romantic love decline, they do persist. Oh, great. Hardly a reason to pop the champagne, is it? Back to HS2, the endlessly long rope slowly being deposited by this government has hit a new depth in the bowl. The cost of the project has now risen to £66.6 .6 million with a shock revelation that the trains on the line will be slower than the trains currently travelling between Birmingham and London. So not only will it take longer going from outskirt to outskirt, but you're wasting more time actually sat on the train. This appalling project has cost the taxpayer millions, displaced families and is a crumb of the plan originally proposed. Joining me now is, is a resident of Lichfield, Chris Wilkinson, who has had his life upturned by the chaos of the now abandoned Birmingham to Manchester line, as well as chair of Stop HS2, Penny Gaines. Welcome uh, to both of you. Um, as I'm reading uh, into what's going on here at HS2, it's beginning to sound like another uh, post office scandal in the making, isn't it? Because it seems to me that there's nobody in Parliament, nobody at any level of the big company that's putting all this together, actually asking the question, are you sure? Do we really need to do this? Penny, let me start with you. I mean, I'd love to say good luck with Stop HS2, but, I mean, it's not going very far or very fast, but what's going on? Well, it's, it's not really very clear, is it? The, the cost has gone up. You said earlier that it's doubled. That was the line I was going to use. Um, it's doubled since it was first announced, and that was for the whole of the, the line. So it's it's now going to be 66 billion from the outskirts of London to the, to, to Curzon Street in Birmingham. Right. Um, like you said, the trains, once they get off HS, the HS2 route, are going to be slower than the existing trains. The case for the business case is completely demolished with the pandemic and the number of people who no longer need to to travel to get to, to do business. So so we've said for a long time that video conferencing and the like would, would take over the need for travel. Um, and with the pandemic, we've all seen that happening. Um, the environmental case isn't there. It's going to be causing in, increased um, carbon emissions for 120 yeah. years after opening. And the cost has gone up so much. It was always an expensive project to begin with, but the cost is just now ridiculous. Well, it is. And the end result, of course, Penny, is, is that you don't really get anywhere quicker and most people don't want to go that way anyway. Chris, let me come to you, because you've suffered for a long time at the hands of the organisers of this ridiculous project. Tell us your story. What actually happened? So... Uh... I come from Litchfield and I work in Burton-on-Trent, so my commute is basically up the A38 every day. And there is a huge HS2 work that is going on around Street Hay and Fradley, which is on the on the way there. Yeah. And uh, basically, it is 
a muddy desert just filled with excavators. And there is a slip road that has been very well used to get into Litchfield, which has been completely closed off. So journey times are now at least 10 minutes longer than they otherwise would have been. But not only that, you've got the uh, nightmare of single lane uh, dual carriageways. So basically, there's a massive tailback at morning and evening peak, rush hour, that sort of thing, uh, which, of course, extends journey times even more. And it's led to my journey, certainly, uh, taking over an hour in some cases just to get to work when it's mm. taking 25 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that won't be the only part of the country that looks like that. I mean, we're looking at it now, and it does look like just a wasteland. I mean, I know lots of people who had their houses uh, actually purchased compulsorily off them, um, all, all the way sort of from Uxbridge all the way up to, to the central part of sort of Worcestershire. And many parts of those areas are, are just kind of wastelands. They, they haven't really done much with them. And who's voted for it? I mean, we've had four elections where HS2 has been on the back burner. And uh, I think really it's about time that it came to the forefront. And as you say, uh, name me a single politician who's really vocal against HS2 and its further development. No, exactly. And Penny, I mean, this is a, a, a railway network that doesn't have any particular trains, I don't think, yet, because they're not, they've not been built yet. It doesn't really have much track and just seems to have an awful lot of concrete that's been poured and a lot of bridges that have been built, but there's not actually really any sign that it's going to be ready anytime soon. Yeah, that, that was the thing. The um, chair of HS2 was um, in front of some MPs today, and he said that it was supposed to start opening sort of sometime between um, 2030 and 2033, but it'd be at the end of that, that period. So we're looking at another nine years before you can catch a train between the outskirts of London and, and the outskirts of Birmingham. And it was never designed to connect up to the rest of the high-speed rail network. So you could say, oh, it's, it's not going to, it doesn't connect with HS1. It's never designed to connect with HS1. It was just designed to connect with itself and a few few places along um, in Manchester and so on. So it's not a network. It's, it's, just, it's just going to be a shuttle service yeah. between London and Birmingham. Exactly. I've got some comments here. Um, as the cost of HS2 rises to 66.6 .6 billion, um, basically three sixes usually means the mark of the beast, doesn't it? The moment HS2 was announced, says Lee, this was always going to happen. Um, Alan says, ironically, with the current state of HST, you could get to Birmingham from Euston and Marylebone already. Now you have the amazing process of getting a train about 20 minutes outside of central London to be able to get to Birmingham. And Donald says, imagine the schools and hospitals that could have been built and stopping the connection from London to the northwest uh, got enough trouble as it is. Well, this is the other problem, isn't it? I mean, in terms of um, your actual life, when I talk to Chris Wilkinson uh, from Litchfield, I mean, your life is not going to be improved at all by the completion of HS2, even if it is completed uh, before you pass on. It's certainly not going to be completed before I die, I don't think. I mean, most people in this country are never going to benefit from this, are they? That's absolutely, absolutely right. That's true. It's, Sorry, Penny, It's just a, few, a handful of people. Chris. I think we're all agreeing with each other. Yeah, we are. Just well, a handful of people... Well, I, I mean, I don't know anyone, really, that is actually an advocate of why HS2 is a good idea. Chris, have you met anyone that actually thinks it's a good idea? No, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I'm very much like you. I, I, I went to Birmingham uh, just a couple of months ago, actually, and saw all this construction work going on. Um, it's taking place right next to Birmingham City University. There's one pub which is currently closed outside Curzon Street Station. And pretty much nothing else there. And I thought that that's probably the sole beneficiary of HS2 around that area. Because, yeah. to be honest, you're walking at least 10 minutes to get to New Street Station, which is where all the other services are for the local area. And it's five minutes to get to Moore Street. And between that, you've got the bull ring. So anyone who wishes to uh, make a quick connection is going to be uh, snarled up in the uh, increased football. Well, that's right. And, I mean, um, coming back to you, Penny, they're saying that one of the reasons why the increased cost has happened is because of the increased construction costs. Well, surely, when people put these um, bids in to, to, to get these massive government contracts, they build in 
what might happen in the future. They must have an idea that building costs are going to go up. They must have an idea that inflation is going to have an effect. You know, I don't understand why these people who make these kind of um, assessments of how much it's going to cost are always so wrong. Yeah, it's one of those things. It was very much a finger in the air, go round, kick the tires, see how much they could get away with saying it was going to cost. And then when they started doing the detailed planning, um, they found out all sorts of things, such as, for instance, they'd have to actually buy the land that they were going to, to put it over. Mm. But, um, and then they've got the costs um, of the contracts. The contracts are a so-called cost plus contract, which means that if the cost rises, the contractor doesn't lose out. The money all comes from the taxpayer. Right. So they've got no incentive to, to keep the costs down. Um, and just, just everywhere, it seems to be a case of um, they're writing their own checks. Uh, the current chair is the first chair of, of HS2 for 10 years who's not been from the construction industry. Right. Um, so it's very much there's a, a revolving door of, of um, staff at HS2 and the contractors and going to work for construction companies and the like. So there's not really been an incentive amongst the people who are coming up with costs of it to, to keep them down. No. And like you and have you got any hope that you can actually stop it even more than it's currently been stopped? I mean, it's now not going to go to Manchester, but can you stop any more of it being built? I think there's still quite a high probability. Um, with, the, with the prices going up as much as they can, um, you look at it and you say, what could you do with the, that money if you're putting it to local transport across the country? You could benefit people everywhere if, if you got rid of HS2 and you could have more benefits to more people more quickly if you put that money into a, a series of smaller projects. Um, and they'll be benefiting people within, not necessarily months, but within a year or two. Um, and, and we really think it ought to be cancelled the land that's been um, environmentally damaged be put back and, um, yeah, just, just cancel right. it. We, we think well, that's still the a good chance. That's the thing. And, I mean, and, and back to you, um, Chris, because at the end of the day also, there's an awful lot of homes that have been uh, purchased, an awful lot of land that's been purchased between Birmingham and Manchester, which is now presumably going to have to be sold. I don't know who they're going to sell it to, but if you'd sold your house to the HS2 organisers and the people that were putting it all together, and now it turns out that actually they're not going to put the line there at all, you'd be pretty annoyed. Absolutely. I mean, in terms of the cost estimate, I've studied history reasonably recently. But there was a time when the British Treasury was really frugal about spending money on big ticket items <laughs> like hey, yeah, when was that? things like that. <laughs> I, I, I can't quite remember. It's probably beyond my lifetime. But yeah. uh, I, I definitely know that there was an age when that was the case. But uh, it just seems to me that in recent years, certainly recent decades, uh, the British state has got ever more profligate with taxpayers' money yeah. and uh, is more willing to sort of spend it in ways that are irresponsible or economically useless to most people. Yeah. And uh, I think that the, the housing debacle is very much a, a key part of that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Well, good to talk to both of you. Thanks very much indeed. Chris Wilkinson from Litchfield and Penny Gaines from the Stop HS2 organisation. We must talk again, Penny, because I think we must try and stop them spending any more money. £66.6 .6 billion for something that we don't really need. Amazing. Hitting you hard. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Up next, the scourge of fly tipping as it hits shocking new heights. Plus, we're hearing from you, so it's time for your call. Stay right there. Call me. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We've got some breaking news from the United States of America. The former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, is set to suspend his campaign for the Republican presidential nomination. Uh, now, um, of course, we'll find out more about that as the show goes on, because Chris Christie was never going to get the nomination and he was never going to beat Donald Trump. But why is he suspending his, uh, his, cal his calendar now? Who knows? We'll find out. But coming up, uh, Hoseswood in Kent has become the unfortunate hotspot for fly tippers, driving up and dumping all kinds of filth to rot amongst the trees. Much to the dismay of the locals, our correspondent Nick Ellaby paid a visit to the site today. This part of Hodes Wood in Kent used to have deer running around among the trees, but now it's being turned into a dumping ground by illegal fly tippers. Mountains of commercial waste dumped secretly and the smell is horrendous. And then just after we arrive, a lorry turns up with another truckload of rubbish. When the driver sees us, they turn around and drive off. Locals tell me the fly tipping here has been happening since last July. Carl Ford, an electrician who works nearby, says he sees lorries coming and going every day. Every time I've come down this road, there's a lorry coming from the main road that comes out of um, High Halden. They're going off that way somewhere, I don't know where, but also you'll see local light, small trucks come along and dump rubbish here all the time. A number of other locals tell me they've tried to report it to the Environment Agency and have complained to Kent County Council. The Environment Agency told us it is leading an ongoing investigation into the alleged illegal tipping of commercial waste at Hodes Wood with support from Natural England, the Forestry Commission, Kent County Council and the police but they can't comment any further at this time. They do say if you're suspicious of any waste crime, you can report it on their 24-7 incident number. Meanwhile, if the fly tippers here are ever caught and stopped, this bit of British woodland, supposedly a site of specific interest for its wildlife, will take weeks to clear. And it goes on all over the country. I've got this from um, MR. It's become a huge problem throughout the UK and a burden to the taxpayers. Stronger penalties are needed and confiscation of vehicles. Persistent offenders should be jailed. And a lot of people think there should be stronger penalties. 97% of people we are said yes. Stronger penalties for this kind of horrible, horrible 
sort of desecration, particularly of the countryside, uh, around very, very many beautiful parts of Britain. Joining me now is Kevin Richards, a man local to the problem there. And frankly, it's been getting on your wick, hasn't it, Kevin? Uh, yes, it has. Tell us what you've been spotting and, and how bad it is. Well, it's been ongoing for uh, since, um, as far as I'm aware of, uh, year 2000, so that's like 23, 24 years plus. Right. Uh, in this road, the country road, which is fly tipping, and it's so bad that I actually damaged my own vehicle one day um, during a, a night because there's no street lighting right. along the road at all. And um, it's just uh, totally terrible. Uh, in the summer of 20. 22, uh, we presume it was children lit fires uh, to the rubbish and it was burning for like most of the day and most of the night as well. Right. And it's just totally terrible. It's like beyond a joke now. It really and is. I've actually, uh, I've actually took a video of it, put it all over Facebook, sent it to my MPs of Bexley Council. I did send the video to the BBC, but nobody wanted to know. Well, we want to know because it's happening uh, in lots of different places. And what you see there, is it largely like commercial dumping? Is it big lorries? Is it people with vans or is it people um, with, with house um, and stuff as well? Yeah, well, it's all sort of stuff. It's lorries, vans, cars. I've even seen people during the daytime doing it. And uh, people don't care because... They think it's a country lane, uh, which is a dead end road, and nobody goes mm. down there. Right. Um, and what rubbish you can see, which is shown now, uh, that's only like 10% 10, 10 yeah. of the rubbish dump there. And what happens is because either side of the road is a dike, the dike gets filled up with rubbish. Right. And during the spring, summertime, all the grass and weeds, flowers, and that grow through the rubbish. And it all gets hidden, like out of sight, out of mind. That's horrible. But it's we're, still just, there. we're just looking, um, Kevin, at your film that you sent us, and, and, and it really is dreadful, isn't it? There's all kinds of rubbish there. There's bits of furniture, <laughs> bits of, uh, of paper. It would seem. I mean, is there a rat problem? Is there a fox problem? Uh, there's rats there. There's foxes there. There's even tires amongst that. Mm. But the thing is, because um, I wasn't prepared for this, I didn't know until after I'd finished. Uh, until I was in work today, that uh, you needed to see some footage. Yeah. Uh, by the time I finished work, it was dark, so you're only seeing a little tiny bit of what's actually there. Right. And if I was able to uh, show you, uh, make a video on the weekend during the daytime, uh, I think you would be a lot more shocked yes. at what's there than well, listen, what you are do. now. Please do that for us, Kevin, because this is a massive yeah. problem for an awful lot of people. I mean, some people say the reason it happens a lot now is because um, it's not that easy to dispose of stuff, if you're a commercial operator in particularly, because you can't take it to the local dump, uh, or if you do take it there, they charge you a lot of money for it. Yes, and uh, another thing I want to add, uh, I used to work for a skip hire company, right. um, which I can't name them on, on you. Yeah. But uh, I actually went to one of the customers that delivered a skip on, uh, on, on his driveway in Kent. And, and the customer told me that um, he had a load of rubbish on his driveway by his garage and people were knocking on his doors uh, saying they would remove the rubbish for 40 quid. Huh. And he's turned around and told them no because he knew there was to actually dispose of his rubbish legally would cost a lot more than forty pounds, and his rubbish would end up in a lane or a driveway yeah. or down the country yeah. uh, 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 field or something like that. Yeah, it's a real blight on everything. Kevin, listen, thanks for talking to us. Kevin Richards there, um, who's an angry resident uh, from Kent, from that Hodeswood beauty spot where people seem to be dumping stuff at will. I'm sure there's many of you that have seen it as well, and many of you have been getting in touch. So you can have your say right here, of course, on the socials at Talk TV and on the phones, 0344 499 1000. Uh, let's hear from John in West Lothian, uh, who wants to talk about fly tipping up in Scotland. Hi, John. Yeah, good evening, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's all sorts of problems here. Um, I think the, the councils are trying to 
uh, make a lot of money out of uh, charging people to go and do it legally, so yes. they just do it illegally, and that, that's for the commercial people. And also on the uh, private householders who used to be able to drive along to recycling centres and get rid of their waste just by driving in and waiting in a the queue, they, they, they've now got a booking system in a lot of areas, so people, are, their bins are full, so what do they do? They just take it and just dump it. Yeah. And, and the, 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 there is no real enforcement on this because unless you've got something with your name and address on it or something, nobody, nobody's ever going to find you. No. No, so that it, is the problem. No. And I've, I mean, I've seen it. Uh, you know, I drive around a reasonable amount in the southeast of England and you suddenly see just acres and acres of just places where people have put rubbish. And as soon yeah. as somebody sees what, some pile of rubbish, they're going to add to it for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, the commercial companies should be encouraged to go and they're not overcharged for getting rid of it through, yeah. you know, legal means. With the private people, I think you've actually got to start very early on, you know, from right from school age, by yeah. educating people yeah. and, and trying to, to, to make them responsible for their environment. And I think that, you know, our local school is actually exceptionally good at that. But not everybody is, yeah. and and they actually educate their parents in many respects, yes. not to throw things out of car windows. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Um, we've got another caller on this, so thanks, John. Uh, Mark's in Bristol. Let's see what it's like down in his neck of the woods. Mark, very good evening to you. Hi, Mike. Good evening. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, here in Bristol, uh, a lot of the uh, recycling centres, obviously, they charge as well now. Right. Anything, anything they can to to get money out of you. But more importantly, it's very confusing when you go to uh, recycle anything. If you have an odd number on your number plate, mm -hmm. you can go on a specific day right. and even numbers on another day. Right. How are you so supposed you to know that? Well, <laughs> you have to go, and if you've got a car full of rubbish and you've got an odd number and it's an even day, uh, you're stuffed. Right. That's mad, absolutely mad. Mm -hmm. But also, I know a lot of people, um, and I know lots of parts of the country, where they've done away with recycling centres, where you could literally go and put bottles, or you could put clothes, or you could put, you know, uh, cardboard or whatever. And a lot of places that used to have, you know, say, a car park next to a supermarket where you could do that, they've taken it all away. Well, they, they have taken, taken away in a lot of places, but there are, there are a few left, but they are always absolutely rammed. Yeah, because they don't empty fire. them. Yeah, well, they're, they're never emptied, and those that are emptied, that the, the restrictions on what you can put there are, are ludicrous. Yeah, you you can't put you can't put brown bottles in. You can only put clear bottles. Uh, green bottles go in another bin on every other Wednesday. It's just ridiculous. Absolutely stupid. Mm, it really is. Absolutely mad. Listen, thanks for your call. Uh, this is something I think that's going to run and run, because I know of people who have been fined, actually, for putting the recycling that they were putting somewhere into the wrong bit, and then some council uh, jobs were turned up uh, at their doorstep and gave them a fine. PCN for that. Um, now, I bet a few of us have dug ourselves a hole in our lifetime, uh, but nothing quite like this literal tunnel girl, Kaya. She's in America. The self-proclaimed engineer has gone viral on social media for building an elaborate tunnel system underneath her house. After Carla's TikTok video recapping the tunnelling progress hit over 7.5 million views, she's been forced to stop by officials over fears that it could cause a sinkhole. So imagine looking at this uh, woman's actual digging. People uh, in the neighbourhood where she lived in Virginia in the US were saying, yeah, we started seeing all these piles of bricks and things in her garden. We wondered what she was up to. It's one of these weird stories, I think, um, and the panel's back here, I'm going to explain it to you, where, um, you know, in America, some of these people get obsessed with the end of the world. Yes. Or, you know, the government's Practice. coming for them. And they're, they're basically building kind of, you know, these rescue centres. Their tinfoil hats. Their tinfoil and all hats are on. Love it. Um, and, they, and she's built this entire network of tunnels underneath her own house. Yeah. But I don't know what's more bizarre. is the fact that she does that, or yeah. the fact that over 7 million people tune in to yeah. watch... Well, have you ever watched anybody watching TikTok? You know, I've done it because I can't watch TikTok myself. It's a sort of... You it's like a, watching other people. Well, I've seen my kids doing it. It's a sort of instant ADHD nightmare yes. because they're kind of just flipping from one thing to another and it's taking you from A to B to C to D. To D. And you're going, this is ridiculous. But you've got a hit if you've, if you've watched something for about 20 And it seconds. is a dopamine hit, unfortunately. It really is. And that, that's why our brains are almost changing. We get, we're going to have a whole generation of people who have no attention span yeah. whatsoever. The attention yeah. span of a goldfish is what they say, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the fly tipping we just did there because at the end of the day, I think everybody suffers in some way, shape or form, yes. depending on where you live. You see, I mean, I've seen people in my neighbourhood going out in the middle of the night 
taking stuff that they've piled up outside their house into a van, and you think, well, where are they taking that yeah. at midnight? And presumably they're taking it somewhere just to dump it. Oh, it's scandalous. It's like mattresses. You can't yeah. get rid of mattresses and things like that. You've got to arrange it with the council. But all that nonsense, as you say, about the odd or even number plates. Yeah. How on earth people understand right. that? It's all this nonsense. Especially if you are... I mean, I used to... I mean, we've all done it at some yeah. point or other. You fill the car up with all the old junk out right. of the shed or something. You drive off and wait in a queue to get to the place. And then yeah. they go, oh, no, sorry, you've got an even <laughs> number plate. You'll have to go. And you go, you go well, I'm not going to take the kids to school in the morning. I'm going to empty all the stuff out. But what a her horrendous sense again. of entitlement that people must have that they would actually defile a beauty spot, a sort of nature. Yes. To, to think that, mm. oh, it's OK, everyone else can enjoy the scene and now I'm going to tip my rubbish in. Yes. I think that's shameful. But I think, again, it comes down to money. I mean, if you're going to be, if you're running a, a small business and yes. you're one man with a van or something like that, and every time you go to try and take stuff to a dump, they charge you 40 quid. Mm. You know, that's quite a lot of money, isn't it? No, well, waste... I mean, waste management is meant to be efficient and it's meant to meet the needs, but so much of the sort of push for... Not to make this, like, a green thing, but I think the sort of narrative around trying to get people to recycle means that you, you know, we're ignoring the fact that people still have white goods, mattresses, yes. yeah. crap in the back room that right. doesn't fit into the green bottle, right. white bottle And, and it's important scenario. to make the distinction between legal dumping yes. and illegal. And but, as you say, the, the legal one is where you can say if you've got these odd number plates on yes. certain days, you go along that, and you can pay the council to come away and take away your mattress and things like that because you've done yeah, but that. They, but it's, that it's, there are certain councils that now people are not getting their rubbish taken away for over problem, two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. But, that, but this is the sort of, you know, we forget that people stuff like this behind the scenes of life have to happen mm. so all the there's the thing that really gets me going and very annoyed is you know discussion about building on people who don't want to build on the green belt always yeah. say well we there's so many brownfield sites that yeah. we need to turn into houses right. brownfield sites are where tips exist yes. so the sort of the behind the scenes secret infrastructure of cities or towns are places where people can put rubbish and do things like that right. We're getting rid of them and everything's turning into right, yeah. a recycling centre which costs 40 quid or whatever a visit and you have to do jump through all these hoops. So obviously people... Well, I mean, what choice do people have? They either leave it in the right. back garden if they don't have a garden. They drive somewhere that's already got a few piles of rubbish and dump it there. I'm not saying it's right, right. but... What are you meant to do if you well, can't get rid of it? And, I mean, we constantly hear from the, sort of the Green Brigade, oh, we must reduce packaging, we must get yes. rid of all the rubbish that we've got. But we somehow have more rubbish since they've been getting rid of the packaging. <laughs> somehow there's more rubbish than ever, isn't oh, there? Oh, absolutely. It's, I mean, Christmas always comes and goes, and you end up... I mean, I just burn stuff, and people castigate me and say, you're not supposed to burn stuff. <laughs> it's the best way to get rid of it. Mm. And I'm not talking about burning plastic, I'm talking about just burning paper. Go outside, there's the incinerator, chuck the paper in, Great fun for all the family. Uh, you, stay, you stay warm as well. There you go. You know, and it's actually the, the answer. If you can do it, you should. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. But but the video which you keep showing is mm. is an illegal vote, which is why they sort of tried to scarf yeah. it as soon as somebody turned up. So we need to make the distinction, but it needs to be better from a legal point of view. Yeah. We turn around and say, let make it easy for people to get rid of their rubbish. Why can't they actually install cameras? Admittedly, you don't necessarily want loads of cameras in lots of forests, but yes. there must be number plate recognition uh, technology. There, there are so many cameras everywhere. You think they they could. But this is the trouble, isn't it? They've got CCTV cameras in all the wrong places. But I'm yeah. glad you mentioned cameras, because it brings me on to the next story. Have you seen this robo camera that they've got in Morrison's <laughs> Morrison's supermarket where they say um, they've had terrible problems with shoplifting. Yes. Uh, they're now putting these robo cameras in which can film people as they're shopping and they put it in the, particularly in the alcohol aisle of yes. where people just nick stuff all the time. There it is. Um, and um, I think it's quite a good idea, actually. It's a great it saves, idea. It saves, because they say it's working. They say less, fewer people are now actually nicking things because yeah. they see that they're on film as opposed to wondering whether there's a camera somewhere. Yes. Um, and it means you don't have to have people actually trying to stop people leaving. Yeah. You don't have to have violent episodes. Well, to actually have fighting. employees in a supermarket. Well, yeah, but... but, yeah, but we they, might yeah, actually but, have staff. Well, I mean, it would be nice to have employees at the tills, but you shouldn't have to, as an employee of a supermarket, wrestle somebody to the ground and, and trying and to run right, off with a bottle of Jack Daniels. You know and what you mean? can work... No. Even with a dummy one, you can work. So what they've How worked out is... <laughs> I assume that's what you did. Yeah, I mean, I walked out of the local <laughs> supermarket with that just this afternoon. Well, we, we love Nobody it. Nobody stopped me.
It's a great dish. I, w <laughs> I went to Lithuania fairly recently, uh -huh. and the whole thing, there was one particular store, which is all cameras, no, no staff at all, and you pick up an item from the thing, and it basically electronically tells you you've got yeah. your, your brand. So it's like a vending machine. It's like a vending machine. A giant and, vending and you machine. have cameras everywhere, and it basically will do that. That is the future of retail, and, and the honesty as a result of it is tremendous. And what they're saying with this retail stuff... Well, it's like, all very middle class, though, Andrew. I mean, it's all very middle well, class. You go into <laughs> well, I, I went to Lithuania. That's well, you know, I love taking my, my shopping, and I just put you know, pay for it. Yes. A lot of people would say that that is an opportunity to just rip everything off. Well, but and they, not they monitor paying. it. And there are hotels now. Where if you pick up your bag of peanuts, right. they know you've picked up your peanuts. You don't have to tick the honesty box yeah. anymore. Right. And all of that is going to be the future of retail. So the idea, as you know, I speak around the world as a yeah. futurist saying what's going to happen. Yes. It's exactly that. You're going to get fewer and fewer actual people. Mm. It's all going to be done with cameras and, and robots and stuff. And you know what they're doing? So in Japan, yes. they have robots that look like people. I mean, they, yes. they don't look like people, but they you can almost amorphize them. They've got things that look like eyes and things yes. that look like bodies. And they reckon that that actual, that's going to really inspire people to not uh, shoplift because oh, they no, feel like true. they're being either looked at by a human being yes. or they feel sorry for the little creature. They're, they're, their heart goes out to this little creature. Well, yes. And as a result, they're not shoplifting. I, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Don't we have to, not, not to be the sort of bleeding heart liberal here, but don't we have to kind of ask the question of why there are such high levels of <laughs> shoplifting because I'm not convinced that it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not convinced that it's that everybody's poor and therefore they must no, it's turn not. No. to no. shoplifting. It's because they but can. It's but, because they can. Well, but then you get into kind of misanthropic territory where you're saying unless we're being watched by some, I have to say, quite rudimentary looking box. Right. Very British robot, that. Yeah. So it doesn't yes. really look like it. doesn't do thing. much. <laughs> um, but, you know, th that we will only behave if we're being CCTV'd. I don't, that, I don't I still like that either. Unfortunately, I that if only you could go back to having a supermarket yes. that had tills and that had people manning those tills. Yes. One of the biggest iniquities of the whole of the kind of the, like the last generation has been self-service tills yeah where you know unexpected item in the baggage area is the bane of everyone's life and, and, and there are so many people and i have watched them around me and they have they just think to themselves you know what i i'm i'm shopping i'm paying you money yes. and and now you're telling me i've got to go through the whole thing of and, checking and it out as well right. and so shopping, actually i'm going to take well, shopping is a the leisure workers. activity for a lot of people and they want to have that interaction with people well, yeah. think about and this rise in lo loneliness yes. there's so many elderly people wandering around supermarkets yeah. trying to stay warm they actually just want to have a conversation with and people. interestingly that's where ai and robotics are going really going to help because in terms of companionship, the rise, joking aside, the rise of things like AI girlfriends is tremendous. And they did, a, uh, did some research. The University of California... This conversation is true. taking a strange turn. <laughs> but the, the University of California the... said that chatting to chat GPT yeah. was more empathetic than chatting to your GP because you can't get hold of them and they've got longer time to do it. So the rise of companionship in AI and robotics is going to be tremendous. And it's also a very I think particular I'd type of attachment. <laughs> there, there is a sense in which it's very positive at reinforcement. Yes, absolutely. But actually, I still don't think that that's going to stop you shoplifting. What you need are more people manning the team. What you actually need is a robot that goes, Shopping for you. No, oh, they already have it. You just call them up or you order it online and they bring it to your house. It's true. My house Job do done. That. You can you do know, that. Absolutely. All you need now is somebody to take my rubbish away. Yes. You've got them as well. Okay. Um, it's not as bad as you think, you know. Well, we need, we need an ITV drama to sort Oh, of. I love it. That's the one, yeah. you, definitely. Recycling in three parts. I thank you. Brilliant Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Come on. Uh, we don't want to get too ridiculous here. But up next, we're going to talk about the e scooter, the bike, the e bike, the menace. It's now at risk of setting fire to your house. Plus, the first sneak peek and all the big stories in tomorrow's papers. Do not go anywhere. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. It's been a bit nippy out this week, so the plague of cyclists on our streets has been mercifully absent so far. They don't like the cold weather, you see, or the rain, for that matter, but there are still loads of electric bikes weaving in and out of traffic, often on the way to your house for some pizza or a Chinese takeaway. I've continually warned of the dangers of electric everything, whether it's cars, vans, buses, lorries, bikes. Not only are there not enough charges to go around, there simply isn't enough capacity in the country for all these iPhones on wheels to be catered for. How many stories have you heard about owners of electric cars queuing up for an hour to get their car charged up at a public charging point? How many times have we seen electric vehicles spontaneously combusting and causing massive pollution with their toxic smoke and fumes? Well, now, there is yet another reason to beware the advent of electric bikes, and it's a deadly one. Last August, a fire broke out in a flat in North London as a result of an electric bike bursting into flames while it was being charged. Tragically, pensioner Bobby Lee, aged 74, lost his life. He died as a result of severe burn injuries and the inhalation of toxic fumes. His family, of course, were devastated. They tried in vain to evacuate him from his ground floor bedroom, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. The cause of the deadly blaze was recorded by the coroner's office as the overcharging of a mountain bike that had been transformed by a conversion kit. The fire started when the bike's lithium-ion battery was overcharged by an unsuitable device with no battery management system. Coroner Ian Potter blamed a lack of regulation on e-bike conversions, which is becoming more and more popular as they're cheaper than doing it right, and issued a warning about the dangers of e-bike batteries and chargers. The fire service has already advised people not to store them indoors and to only charge them outside. But, of course, the eco-nutters don't care, as long as they've got an electric bike that's saving the planet. Last year alone, they were responsible for nearly 200 fires, and that's just in London. Tragically, the bike had been bought by another member of Bobby's household, and the conversion kit cost as little as £100. Sadly, though, Bobby's family paid a far higher price. And that is tonight's World of Work. Now, the panel's back with me. Before we look at the, pa the front pages of the papers, guys, I just wanted to bring to your attention a rather odd story from Andrea Leadsom, <laughs> who I must confess I thought was no longer an MP, but apparently she still is. Yes. Um, she's apparently been claiming um, that, basically, you can have teeth before you're actually born. <laughs> now, 
I don't know if we've got um, a little uh, video clip of this. Let's have a look. In the opposition's proposal today, they're talking about supervised toothbrushing for three to five year olds. Now, I don't know if they don't know this, but actually, you have teeth from before you're born. So, if you don't get your supervised toothbrushing until you're three, at a minimum, that's about your teeth are about four and a half years old. And it's much more important to get that supervised toothbrushing. Um, <laughs> sorry. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say, really. Bad. I mean, before teeth before conception. you were born. But it's before conception. I mean, listen, I've had well, four children, right? I've seen uh, those, you know, uh, images of the baby in the womb. Yes. Um, yes, you can tell whether it's a boy or a girl. I've never seen teeth. But it is I must confess. But working backwards, and she said she sort of misspoke because it's basically working on those sort of figures. She said before they're three, it's like four and a half years earlier. That would make the, the baby 18 months before it's born, which is before conception and things well, like that. Well, yeah. It's, it's Diane Abbott in terms of finger fudging. I hate it. to defend Ledson, but there is, I mean, they, there is there in the jawbone or something technically that there is the promise of teeth. But the, the idea that you would be brushing a two month old's. <laughs> Gums but not before conception. That's but, the idea of 18 months. Do you, think, well, she was, do you think she was confusing it with that whole idea that when a, a girl is born, yes. it has all the eggs, eggs that yeah. it will ever need? Do you think yes. she had that kind of vision? Well, but I, I, whether or not she was being confused, the most depressing aspect of this is that Labour has <clears throat> announced this sort of "We love the nanny state. Yeah. We're gonna, yes. we're gonna brush your kids' teeth." Well, for they've you said, haven't they? They've thing. not only said that, but they actually watched the kids' Starmer. It's in the Times today. Well, um, apparently, they want to make children healthier, happier, and taller. Yeah. Oh, quite right. By, by five foot being, eight. Five foot eight is Starmer, and uh, instead, of, only instead of pushing, six, think, yes. instead of pushing back and saying, "Thank you very much, I can brush my own kids' teeth." Yeah. Yes. Andrea Ledson comes in and says, "No, we want to do it earlier." So the Tory party's now saying, "No, we will brush your kids' teeth well, even earlier." I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? They're talking about teeth because, I mean, I know lots of families who can't get their kids into a dentist yeah. because there's simply no exactly. more and capacity. And I also know people yeah. who have had their kids kicked out of a dental Me. surgery. Me. Right, I've there you go. Out. Anna can't get my And you can't get back in, right? Yeah. So and, and, it's all very that, well saying, let's keep point. their teeth clean, but if yeah. you can't see a dentist... And that was her point. And to her credit, she actually clarified afterwards. She sort of... She said she misspoke. It's all right to admit that you've got it wrong. Her point not really. was... No, <laughs> sorry, I'm not having it. You're standing in probably the most important yes. part of the country when you're giving information to people, yes. you should be getting it right. You oh, should no, not I, be I, I making it. up stories about people having teeth when they're in the womb. Well, she, she, was, she was saying you can't get to a dentist until you're four and a half, which is why it's a bit late. And this is why there's... Well, because you can't get you can't get on the bus until you're four and a half. There you go. You know, I mean, the, the whole thing is ludicrous. I don't understand how Andrew Ledson can uh, actually even return to public life after this. I think, you know, she should lock herself away <laughs> and tooth never tooth come out ever again. Tooth. Absolutely. Andrea Ledson, the tooth fairy. The tooth, the tooth fairy, fairy. There you go. Absolutely right. Um, so we'll come back to Starmer and Taller Children. Let's yes. do um, the story on the front page of The Telegraph. Incredible. Um, yet more um, incredible sort of revelations for the post office story. Um, you spotted this, Lucy. Post office handed out bonuses for getting people convicted. Isn't this the most horrendous Perfect. opening statement that I've read? An yeah. opening sentence to any article in probably the last 10 years. Post office investigators were offered cash bonuses for every sub postmaster convicted. Yeah. During that. So they had an incentive to do Unbelievable. these. To, to damage these people's lives. That is arguably the biggest tragedy of it. And is anybody from the post office receiving any sanctions for this? I don't think so. Also, it's alleged that Adam Crozier, who was chief executive of the Royal Mail, he should have been aware. Absolutely. Or was actually made aware that the horizon... And, and, and what's dramatically interesting and a, a major omission from the ITV series is that Adam Crozier doesn't feature at all. He was indeed head of the Royal Mail. Yes. He but went on to ITV. He was then head of ITV. ITV. And he's not mentioned... I can't all. imagine why he doesn't uh, appear in the ITV. I, I wonder why, right? Uh, scenario. I can't <laughs> imagine how that could have happened. Perhaps now, Martin Sheen wasn't available. Ah, yeah, well, yes. exactly. Yeah, we'll come back to him. Michael Sheen. <laughs> Gary Thomas, who works in the Post Office security team, yes. um, basically said that bonus targets affected how he went about his work. He also said that uh, uh, people were branded crooks. Sub-postmasters were branded crooks in emails that were sent yeah. on official, mm. you know, post office business. It, it's it's, it's awful. I mean, we yeah. know that there was the kind of, not just the disbelief of people, but the demonisation. There was one woman who um, was really emotional in one interview talking about how she had, you know, tried to take her own life. And the post office hadn't believed her when she mm. said, I was in hospital for yeah. this horrendous event, um, and sent their own doctors to come and make sure that she really yeah, had God, tried yeah. to do this. I mean, it was it's it's animal behaviour. It's, it's awful, below isn't it? human. It's and this is the thing, when people say to me, well, you know, 
there was a lot of incompetence and there was a lot of negligence, and it was much worse than that, because these were deliberate acts carried out by vindictive people who were running the post office and who decided to pick on innocent families but and ruin their lives. I, I, you're absolutely right. Interestingly, in the front of the Telegraph, it also yeah. talks about the fact that... I think more of this is going to come out, that the CPS had prosecuted people and had cases around this... Yeah. From a very early stage, there was... I mean, obviously, the Telegraph asks whether or not it was Keir Starmer was in his position in the CPS at the time. That's neither here nor there. But there's... I think more is going to come to light about the fact that people in positions of power and influence knew what was going on. And, yeah. you know, hopefully that's what an inquiry will bring more to light. But also within the legal light. system, if these post sub-postmasters were meant to have taken all this money... Yes, yes. Where, Where was had it? they put Where, where's this money? money? Yeah. And how come so many of them systematically mm. didn't have that money no. in their own Absolutely. bank accounts? And, and when they say, and you hear this in, in, in the dramatisation, you're the only one who's ever had a problem. Yeah, yeah. And it's that assumption another of lie. guilt. And, 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 another lie. It's the assumption of guilt rather than the assumption mm. of innocence. Yeah. And that is abhorrent and needs to be addressed. It is. Talking about the assumption of guilt or innocence, um, Prince Andrew strolling ah. happily through <laughs> Central Park. Um, that famous picture from, I think, yes. 2019... No, 2011, sorry, um, in Central Park in New York, which proves that Prince Andrew was still friends with yes. uh, Jeffrey Epstein after he had served time for being a paedophile, um, is recreated. I didn't realise Michael Sheen was playing... Prince Andrew. He looks more like Rowan Atkinson. He, he does. Than Prince and, Andrew. And, and, and um, he's, and he's but so whoever good. they've got yeah. for Epstein is an absolute dead ringer. He's, for he's him. very good. And this Michael is, Sheen's um, very good, isn't he? He, he? He's played Tony Blair, Kenneth Williams, David Frost. Yeah, he's got a bit Ruff. woke lately, he's, though. He's good. Did you see that weird thing he did about Wales? Did oh, he yes. Not, and he wanted to change the name of the, um, uh, the Brecon Beacon. Yes. Because he's gone all kind of you know, native in Wales. And he's kind of <laughs> decided he needs to stand up for in the Druids or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't go. know what's happened to him. But, I mean, yeah, he's a great actor. But, yeah, you know, a great actor. Stay away from the... Uh, stay away from the Druids. The public <laughs> announcements, I think. <laughs> with this, I but he's got the hand gesture. That's what they keep saying. We've been practising that we together. Have, I, I think we, we could have done this. it. We could have done this. Well, I, wrong, I, I look more like Prince Andrew than Michael Sheen. I think yes. you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, there's two um, shows coming out. There's this yes. one, which I think is called the... Uh, what's it called? Uh, a very royal scandal. Well, there's yes. the other one, Scoop, which is based, I think, on Sam well, McAllister. That, that's right. And yeah. a lot of it is he only has himself to blame because this one in particular that Martin Sheen's playing yeah. on plays a lot of the Newsnight interviews. Right. So it's... Uh, because they're it's both a... based on the whole Newsnight yeah. experience, mm -hmm. you know, which was a so A drama ridiculous. of his own making, Which I, I've still never quite got over the fact that he thought that went well. Car crash, Because absolutely. I know Sam a bit and, you know, we've spoken about it and she yes. was like, she couldn't believe what he'd said, right. and they tried... When they went to Emily Maitlis, you know, would you like to see around the palace? Yeah. And she was like, oh, yes, please. Sam was like, I'm getting out with the film because sooner or later somebody in here is going to realise <laughs> this was a really bad idea <laughs> and I'm getting the hell out before they, they ask me to, to leave it all behind. Right. You know, incredible stuff. Let's talk about uh, nuclear power stations. Six million homes, apparently, are going to be powered by nuclear power. Anybody worried about that? I mean, I'm not. I no, think nuclear fun. power is great. Very clean, as long bring as it's not dangerous. Bring it along. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd rather have that than windmills, I think. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's right. And as long as it's safe. I mean, the, the people will talk about nuclear. They always talk about the, the explosions and things. I mean, there that aren't many, from. really. Are there? No, they're exactly. There haven't yeah, been Yeah, but do very you really many. want to have a nuclear power station down your road? Well, I wouldn't compared, move into a road that had one in it, probably, to, no. Compared to a lovely, beautiful um, wind farm. I'd prefer it to fly to. A lovely, beautiful wind farm. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I think you've used the wrong adjective there. <laughs> They're not they're lovely, so beautiful. Graceful. They're not at all graceful. They, are, they kill hypnotic. loads of birds, right? They make a terrible noise they when they're on. And anybody who lives near them will tell you that they create a very odd kind of. You know atmosphere. that the bird thing is just simply that within a generation of birds, that's going to change. But it's just that they well, don't. The birds understand. are going to learn to fly around them. Can I mean, how are they going to learn? Because it's bats the birds well are going to tell them. Like they're should, all dead. We should let a thousand energy sources bloom, have nuclear, wind, whatever, as long as it keeps the light on. I think we're in desperate. Matches at the Listen, moment. I'm just going to keep burning my get. wood in my wood burning. I think that's stuff. good. I, 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 I like to see you. trees which are regenerative, which of course can be re regrown. Yeah. Cut them down. They warm you up. Yeah, you make a good point. I think that's It's fair. very good. Yeah. Now, listen, that's all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham uh, here. Thank you to all my guests. I will see you tomorrow at 9 pm. I'm going to put this on because at the end of the day, there's only one way to end this show. Good night.
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. <laughs>